LLC. And she's going to be joining us. I'm pulling up her bio now so that you guys can um, know who she is. She's been a CRNA uh, for the past 25 years. And when she was doing her pediatric cases, she noticed how upset the kids were. And she'll talk to you all about that. I don't do a lot of peds. So you're going to get to hear her story here shortly. I see she's joined. Diane, do you see the option that says... Um, Join Chris, do you want to join me live? There should be like a box. If not, then here, let me find you. I make it easy for you, girlfriend. Here we go. Now. Hi everyone. I just found it. <laughs> just popped up. Hi everyone. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course, no problem. So I was just doing a quick introduction of you. Um, I know you said you've been in a CRNA for over 25 years. And yes. in, in your pediatric experience, you noticed the kids weren't liking the inductions that we do. So I'll just have you um, go over your bio, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we can get into the questions. How does that sound? Sounds great. Great. Okay. All right. So tell us about yourself. Well, I have been a CRNA for 25 years. I went to anesthesia school last century. <laughs> I, I went to anesthesia school in 1992. And so a few years later, graduated and been a generalist for 25 years. But uh, I'm a bit of a child whisperer, so I always ended up as the default uh, pediatric RNA because a lot of people just don't like pediatrics for a number of reasons. Um, and so um, I did a lot of them, not a lot of sick kids, but enough uh, children, a lot of bread and butter cases and a lot of repeat uh, customers, you know, kids who came back and back and back. And so, uh, I, I had... <laughs> Um, I've had a lot of uh, children who just don't like the mask. I mean, everybody knows kids don't like um, needles, but they don't like the mask any better. And studies show that over 50% of children have significant anxiety with the mask because it smells bad. The SIVO, I don't care what anybody says, it smells bad. Even if you put the, you know, the chapstick in there and, uh, you know, play the music or watch the videos or, or anything else that you want to do. Once yeah. that mask goes on their face, they're like, oh, what the heck is this? And um, so just, they Diane, just did. real quick, tell the people yeah. who, who may not know, you know, who may never have done a pediatric case or even know how we do a pediatric oh. case, just tell them how that's usually done. Okay. Um, so you, you usually meet the the child and their parent in the pre-op area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we tell little white lies to them. We tell them that we're gonna go in the OR, and we're gonna get stickers and we're gonna get a pilot's mask and we're gonna blow up the balloon. The balloon is really just a uh, reservoir bag. The reservoir bag that's hanging on the anesthesia machine that's not exactly what a kid has in mind when you tell them that they're gonna be blowing up a balloon. So they go back there, sometimes willingly, and uh, mom or dad usually comes back. And so what we do usually do is we put them either on the OR table or on mama's lap. And um, sometimes we let them watch a video. Sometimes they have Verset on board. There's you know all kinds of ways to do it. There have been all kinds of approaches to try to make this more palatable. And then we turn on, most anesthesia people will turn on 8% SIBO because they know that they only have a very short time before the kid wigs out. So they'll put this 8% SIBO uh, on their, um, in the mask, put the mask on their face. And that's usually when the kid starts pushing it away. And then we apply, if the kid is not, um, 
accepting, accepting the mask well enough, then we apply a little bit of brutane. Now, for those of you who don't know what brutane is, brutane is a combination of um, two thirds, uh, one third uh, sebal fluorine and two thirds brute force. So basically, you hold the kid down. <laughs> That's I was, what like, I was is. like, I didn't learn about yeah. brutane. So you haven't heard about brutane. Well, that's because you haven't been doing that much in many pediatrics. If you know pediatrics, you know what brutane is. So uh, then you just basically hold the kid down and they yell and scream and cry and, um, you know, take nice big breaths and then they go to sleep. Right. And so, really, it only takes really just a couple of minutes for the kid to go to sleep. So you think, so what's the big deal? What does it matter? It takes one or two minutes and then the kid doesn't, um, you know, they don't remember and then they come back and, you know, and everything's fine. Well, it's really not. So I get a lot of, well, my kids, you know, they, they never resist the mask and, and a lot of, well, it only takes a couple of minutes. So what does it matter? It does matter. I get a lot of people saying, well, the, it's not, why fix it if it's not broke? It is broke because um, these kids, there's an old uh, anesthesia adage that says, the way a kid goes down is the way they come up. So if they go down fighting and screaming they're, and anxious, they're going to come up fighting and screaming and anxious. And uh, there are studies that say that it's uh, linked to emergent delirium and the, mm -hmm. The, it's out, you know, the the jury's out about that. There's a, an anesthesiologist, there are a number of anesthesiologists who want to do studies with the pedia because they're convinced that the anxiety really does contribute to emergence delirium. But, uh, so it causes problems in the OR because the kid's fighting and screaming and crying and it upsets the OR staff and it upsets mama. I've seen yeah. a lot of mothers walk out with tears in their eyes. And, you yeah. Know. Um, and then we have to, you know, while the kid's yelling and screaming, like, go away, leave me alone. Um, they're looking at mom like, mom, why aren't you helping me? Mom walks out crying. And, uh, you know, the whole time we're telling mama, oh, this is normal. This is yeah. normal. No. Yeah. This is natural for a kid to react this way. But really, is it normal? I don't know about that. So. Uh, the other problem with that is um, this anxiety. You can read it. Just, all you have to do is Google it. There are lots of studies that say that uh, this anxiety, this pre-op, this pre-op anxiety, anxiety that is right before induction or during induction, right before surgery starts, is um, associated with maladaptive uh, behavior changes at home, which means that at home the kid will exhibit signs of aggression, regression, bedwetting, nightmares, night terrors, mm -hmm. uh, um, mistrust of uh, medical personnel. And so, mm -hmm. um, so the next time they come back, if they have to come back, uh, they remember, I don't care what anybody says, they remember on some level, even if you give them Versed or Presidex, mm -hmm. they're going to remember on some mm. level because there's something called ex implicit and explicit memory and the two work differently. So even if a kid looks like they are not going to remember, on some level they may remember. And even if a kid looks like they are calm, cool, and collected, uh, sometimes the most uh, anxiety-riddled children are the ones that just sit there, fight, flight, or freeze. So sometimes in response to this fear, they freeze. So everybody mm -hmm. thinks, oh, they're being so good. This is going great. No, they're terrified. Those are the ones you have to wor worry about the most. So that's what a normal um, uh, pediatric induction is like. And not, not with all kids. Only about 50% of kids have significant anxiety with the anesthesia mask. And about half of them will go home and have these maladaptive behavior changes for at least two weeks. Uh, a portion of them will have it for about six months and about 7% will have it for a year or more. Or like my little Z, the little girl that I actually invented this for, um, she will probably have it forever.
Um, so yeah so she was the one that I invented it for it worked great with her it worked great with a lot of my other kids so I finally went home and told my husband I really need to market this so all children have a better um, experience yeah and I mean even though you say it's 50 percent that's still high you know that that's a lot of um kids that we're affecting and even though we're trying to help them during their surgical mm-hmm. procedure um it is traumatic uh mm-hmm. i the few peds cases that i have done because i'm not a big peds fan but it's sometimes it pulls on your heartstrings a little bit too yes. you know they're, they're fighting they're upset and they're kicking oh, yeah. and they're, sc- they're pulling and i mean it's mm-hmm. and when she says eight percent sebo y'all that means all the way up <laughs> all the way up Now, some people are nice and they'll start with a little bit of nitrous and Mm -hmm. work, you know, you know, dial up the SIBO slowly. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of people know that their time is limited. So they will just blast them. Just blast them. Yeah. Yeah. And then they tell you. Yeah, they tell you, okay. like, oh, the more the kid cries, the faster they'll go to sleep, so it's okay. And it's like, oh, it's just. It's not okay. Yeah, no. Especially in this day of caps, patient satisfaction, yeah, hospital facility reputation, all of that. It's it's just not a good idea. I agree. Well, thank you for inventing that. That's awesome. Um, okay, let's get to some of the questions. So we just hey. got the first um, answer. What inspired you to invent it? And so you. You gave us that answer, um, mm-hmm. a, a patient you took care of, and she did well with it. So then you wanted to take it and um, have all kids kind of use it. Right. So, this little girl basically tried to kick my teeth out. So <laughs> I'm like, they are strong. <laughs> They're strong. Yeah. Three They're people like holding them. her down, and she still almost oh. kicked my teeth out. So you would be surprised yeah. how strong a four-year-old can be when they are terrified. Yeah, they're like the little 90-year-old women that all the yes. time they grab onto you. You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> all right, so next question. What was the hardest part in actually creating your impro- your product once you envisioned it? Well, you have to hire people. and mm-hmm. And the people that you hire are not anesthesia providers. So Mm. you have to, I had to be very good at telling them exactly what I needed and what Mm -hmm. I wanted. Mm -hmm. And so you go through this whole process of finding an engineer who can do something called CAD drawings, computer aided uh, designs. Mm -hmm. And you go through a number of these uh, sketches and then you move to the CAD drawings and then you have something called a prototype mate. You, you, these CAD drawings go to a 3D printer, and these 3D printers are so fabulous. It's like, you know how when you copy a little piece of paper and the image comes out? This is like you put the CAD in there, and a 3D version of what you want comes out. Um, so then you take that, see if it's working, and make little adjustments. So that was the hardest part about actually getting the Pedia in my hand so that I could touch it, feel it, see if it worked. And then, um, and then you go from there with uh, the rest of it. How long did that take to get it like a physical model in your hand? Uh, you know, the, the CAD drawing doesn't take that long once the, under, uh, once the engineer uh, gets the idea of what it is that you want. Um, and so that, that means it, it, it really only took a couple of weeks um, to okay. get the prototypes. And then after that, if you, when you're happy with it, you do something called a small volume run. You make small volume run molds to make a few hundred thousand, or, or a few hundred, a few hundred. So, okay. Mm-hmm. Oh. And so all of this is before the patenting, patent, patenting process, correct? No, that's after no. patent. Yeah. So oh. it, when I first had the idea, 
and knew that I wanted to do this. I found myself a great patent attorney and mm -hmm. uh, immediately put in my patent pending. So there are two different things. There's a patent and a patent pending. When you first file with the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trade Office, you get uh, about 18 months later, you get um, your patent pending published at the patent office. But it kind of puts you first in line for this. So that means that no one else can copy this. Um, and that's very important because it's not the person who thought of the idea. It's the first person to file. Mm -hmm. So uh, you start that right off the bat. And that's, that's what I did. You could have... Um, you could also go through the, you know, the prototyping, see if it works, take a look at the market and see if you actually want to go through the hassle of patenting. Um, but to tell you the truth, in the long run, the patent really was not the hardest part. Not, no. not saying that you don't have to work at it, but mm -hmm. that was definitely not the hardest part. No. What was the hardest part? The hardest part was the FDA. The, the okay. Food and Drug Administration. So because PEDIA is going to be used on actual human beings, uh, they want to make sure that I'm not going to hurt anybody with it. So they make you jump through hoops. So there, I would go to work, and then I would come home and do the whole wife and mother thing, and mm -hmm. then I would read federal regulations until my head was about to explode. Oh. Um, Terrible. Yeah. So, so, you know, I called the FDA on a number of occasions. They helped me through it. Um, I did a couple, I did one submission by myself um, just to kind of talk with the, there's an anesthesia branch of the FDA. And okay. so when I got the okay to go through the FDA with something called pre-market notification, um, that's when the real work started. So that was getting everything in line to submit something called a 510K, which means that I had to go through all kinds of testing. It's a little balloon with a whistle on the top. This is what <laughs> it looks like. Come on, this is it. It's like a little balloon, with, and this is like a whistle. And I'm like, it's a whistle with the balloon. What's the big deal? It's a big deal. So um, you have to go through compliance testing to make sure it does what it says you want it to do, ISO regulations, international standards. You have to go through biocompatibility testing, which means that scientists test your materials to make sure that it's not leaching anything or everything's right. And basically the FDA wants to make sure that your device is novel and is just as safe as anything out there on the market already. So uh, that's the hard part because you have to get used to talking to engineers and scientists and and all kinds of companies. And you have to interview people and just you have to learn the jargon because just mm -hmm. like we have a lot of jargon and definitions and acronyms in our business, believe me, everyone else has their own language and you have to get you have to get good at speaking their language or at least get a liaison that can speak for you speak and explain you. things to you. Yes. Now, how long was that process? So that was after the patenting. Pat yes. I don't know why I cannot, but you know what I'm saying. That was after yes. the patenting. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so the, pat the, the patent took about, 18, about uh, three years, three and a half years, which is actually really fast for the patent office. Um, and the FDA... Uh, surprising, it, it usually takes about six months for them to get back with you whether or not they're going to grant you um, clearance, grant you clearance. You could go through all this and they'll say, nope, mm. nope, not going to do this. Mm. Um, but luckily, I had hired a regulatory affairs consultant who got me through the FDA in two and a half months. But that is after I worked on it for two years. And it took me two years to get all my ducks in a row because, basically because I didn't know what I was doing. As okay. I said, 
I had to hire people. I had to learn their jargon. I had to, um, I just had to learn so much, which has been terrifying and exhilarating all at the same time. Of course. So, just yeah. like CRNA school. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And no one can really, just like CRNA school, um, no one can explain this to you until you're in the middle of it. Yeah. You know, and that's why I started um, CRNA Inventors and Innovators, because I have learned so much mm -hmm. that I wanted to impart some of my uh, gained wisdom for other CRNAs who are also on the same path. Awesome. Is that a Facebook group? It's a Facebook group, CRNA oh. Inventors and Innovators. Just sign up. Um, give me your, you know, your, your number so I can look you up and make sure that mm -hmm. you actually are a CRNA. And right. uh, there are some brilliant people on that group. I think we're a group of about 400 now. And there are people on that group who just run the gamut. There are people who, believe me, know much more than I do. Um, so I'm the one who posts most of the time and explain things. And then mm -hmm. when I'm lucky, one of these, uh, gurus jumps on board and, um, lends their opinion and, uh, explanations. And that's the other thing. Uh, I really had a lot of help from the CRNA inventor, uh, business community, meaning that we have some brilliant CRNAs out there who have invented all kinds of things, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I can, I could name a uh, half a dozen right now who are doing, who have uh, really great businesses, really great um, inventions out there who are already marketing and selling. So awesome. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I don't doubt it. We are a brilliant group. So. We are a brilliant group. <laughs> we don't give ourselves enough credit for it. So I really, you know, I'm really glad about what you're doing here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to do it. It's, it's becoming um, uh, bigger than I ever imagined it to become. So I'm just going with the flow for right now. So I'm happy to yeah. do it, though. Um, we definitely need to get our names out there to, to, to have yes. our faces seen so that people you know, who is behind the mask, who's behind the drapes, who's, mm -hmm. who's doing these things. So, right. yeah. Yeah. So would you say, so I've heard you mention cost quite a bit, like you had to pay for this person and, and hire this person. So is, has the cost been um, pretty substantial so far? Um, I don't want to scare anyone, but yes, it, it's, uh, pretty far north of six figures now. Mm. Yes. So, and, and everyone just says a lot of people can't go into invention thinking, oh, I'm, this is like a great product. I'm just going to invent this, get my patent. And then all these big companies are going to be knocking down my door to do this for me. That's just not how it works. Uh, you have to pitch. Um, and you have to put up a fair share of your own funds. Mm. And so, you know, I've been a CRNA for 25 years. My husband and I have been uh, savvy enough to live be beneath our means for years, which I would love to impart to all the CRNAs out there live below your means, you know, save for a rainy day or for your invention or for whatever else is coming up in the future. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that, uh, your F rounds are family and friends and your own finances. So that's really where it starts. Your F rounds, um, because big companies, they're not going to be knocking out on your door at this point. Now I have big companies who are very interested, mm -hmm. um, but that was not the case for a very long time. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You know, Gone with the Wind, that, mm -hmm. that book, it had, it uh, sent out um, uh, whatever, the, the, the novel to like 40 publishers, and it was declined like 
40 times what? before someone picked it up. It's mm -hmm. kind of the same way with invention. Until you look like you have something that's going to make them some dineros, yeah. uh, they don't want to talk to you. Yeah. And they want it's you to assume all the risk. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yes. It's the same with um, J.K. Rowling in the Harry Potter books. I think she was exactly. denied like 13 times or something like that. Right. Yeah. And um, the Elf on the Shelf lady, she, yes. she had like yes. her, her home and was like almost bankrupt. And then right. finally got the offer. So mm -hmm. um I just want to mention, so you guys, I did not tell her to, to say that about the finances. Y'all know I've been talking about finances for like the past mm -hmm. month and living below your means. I didn't yes. prep her to say this. No. <laughs> she this says life experience uh, telling. Yeah. Yeah. And she's been doing this longer than me. So mm -hmm. she is much more wise and has much more experience than I do. And she is telling y'all the same thing live below your means so right. if you can't pay for it at the end of the month don't put it on that credit card <laughs> don't do it so <laughs> okay next question um so how hard was it to pitch your idea when that time finally came well, there are, depends on what kind of pitch you're talking about. Okay. So you always have to have an elevator pitch, which is like 60 mm -hmm. seconds or less. Mm -hmm. Like somebody says, what is your device? The pedia, the pediatric device for induction of anesthesia is the world's first mask-free gas induction system designed just for kids. Mm. That's my pitch when somebody says, "What? what is it? Then there's a three minute pitch that will go into it a little bit more in depth. And then you can get all kinds of pitches together to, you know, have, uh, you know, to have, you know, slideshows or uh, to talk one on one with, um, you know, like this is this is from one of my slideshows, you know, oh. um, you get all kinds of things together. Uh, but. If you're talking about pitching to a big company that you want to license your invention or partner with you or or investors who uh, that you're you're going to want um, money from, you know, like angel investors or something called mm -hmm. angel investors or venture mm -hmm. capitalists, um, you're going to need to get together uh, a financial statement and. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know executive summaries and whatnot. When you're pitching to other to uh, larger companies, you know like the Teleflexes of the world and and or smaller ones like uh, you know, just whatever company, you basically have to go to um, you send out a lot of emails. You um, go to a lot of uh, conventions, uh, ASA as well as. Um, a A and A conventions, okay, um, and uh, meet with these people. Show them your product uh, within limits, within limits, because you have to be kind of leery about talking to some of these people. You kind of get a sixth sense about it after a while. Uh, so, um, so pitching it, it just, it really just depends on the situation. You know, I've pitched to a couple of um, major, like three major companies um and basically it was uh kind of like like m ms you know you sit there you, you you present your case and then people ask you all kinds of questions so as long as you know uh as long as you have the answers um it goes well so the more of them that you do the more the easier it gets that's mm -hmm. all i can say you know mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. know your numbers uh, and and um, and when I say numbers, I mean I mean investigate the market. Like okay. tell them why this is going to make them money. Not that mm -hmm. they're heartless, but these people are in it to That's, make money. Right. Because your invention right. is a product. If it doesn't mm -hmm. turn into a product at some point, it's not going to help anyone. 
It has to be yeah. a product and you have to, you have to make, you have to make it a business. And so at, at one point you, you almost have to decide that this is actually what you want to do because you can't really, you can't really do it part time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You work all day at your daytime job and then this is your, your yeah. evening into morning job. Yeah. Right. When you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what about somebody wanted to know what about crowdfunding? You know, I haven't tried that yet, but someone on the CRNA I and I group just, uh, just um, suggested that to me. So I'll let mm -hmm. you know, you know, I, okay. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm at the point now where I'm about to start a couple of commercial and clinical trials. And then mm -hmm. after, after that, I may be, um, who knows? licensing, I may be partnering, I may, you know, there's a number of different ways I, I, I may go, and so I may need to raise more funds, and so I, I have a couple of investors who are interested, mm -hmm. and uh, crowdfunding is also something I may look into, you know, okay. because I know what to do. I didn't want to take any um, investors on at the beginning, uh, because... I didn't know where it was going to go. And I'm just not the kind of person that would take money from people unless I know it's going somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's just not me. Um, but at this point I know it's going places. So um, I, I would consider letting people invest or I would do the crowdfunding just to get through the next hoop, which is making, I mentioned small volume molds. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to be making large volume molds molds for large volume runs so that I can make hundreds of thousands of these oh. at my place in Singapore. Okay. So that's where your um where the PDA is made is out in Singapore. It it may be. That's the company that oh, I'm okay. with that's now. One it's a United okay. States based company, but their plant is in Singapore. So I had to learn all about the manufacturing part of this is all down the line, and it's probably too much. That's probably a part two, because <laughs> it's it's pretty involved. It's pretty involved. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Now, when you finally do get license from a company, and they say yes, we want you know five hundred thousand of these, then do they pay for it to go out into the hospitals and facilities, or or how does that part work? If it's an exclusive licensing deal, what will happen is, yes, I will turn over my IP, my intellectual property. That's the patent you've been talking about. Okay. Um, for them to use for a certain amount of time. And it has, and most of them will want exclus exclusivity, meaning I can't give 50% to one and 50% to the other. Mm -hmm. So then, yes, it will fall on them to do manufacturing, assembly, marketing distribution uh that's that's a lot that's a that's a lot to 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 bite off because distribution in and of itself is you know a, a big deal and so to get into some of the major um hospital systems you you really do need some back door you know deals right. going on here yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Because right now you're funding everything, right? You're funding, mm -hmm. you know, the the advertising, the marketing. It's all coming from right. from your right. account, right? Right. Yeah. So. And and it's it's small time, but I'm happy to report that um, Pedia actually has about ten thousand followers. So oh, yeah, you know, yeah. So for someone who had no idea what she was doing two or three years ago. <laughs> That's actually what I do when I am um, uh, procrastinating all the business stuff is I'm like, I'm going to make a new post. I'm going to make a new picture and I'm going to talk to my such and such. And that's what I, 
It's actually what I do to procrastinate because I just don't want to do some of the other drudgery of the business. So it yeah. all sounds very glamorous, but believe me, there's a lot of drudgery. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I listened oh, yeah. to a podcast called How I Built This. I don't know. If oh, know. yes. I love that podcast. Yeah. And like you too. Some, some of these stories, you're just like, oh, my gosh. Uh, so I, I wait for the day that we hear you on that podcast. Oh. <laughs> I say my prayers. That's how I start my morning. Every morning I get up, I say my prayers, I do a little meditation, and then I'm ready for the, you know, and I'm ready for the day. That's Excellent. the way my day has to start. Excellent. I didn't tell her to say that either, y'all. Oh, is this all. one of your things too? <laughs> <laughs> we are like kith and kin, Miss Crystal. Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. I love it. All right. Let's go to the next. Oh, so somebody wanted to know how it works. So I'm going to try to play the video here on my phone, and hopefully you guys can see it. Um, if okay. not, make sure you're following um, Diane on Instagram. I will um, do her Instagram is Pedia LLC, correct? P E D I A L L C. Yep. So Pedia like pediatric. Yep. Make sure you're following her on Instagram, and I believe you also have a Facebook um, page for I the do. PD Okay. Pedia. Mm -hmm. So, Pedia LLC on I Facebook. I think it, it might be Pedia Anesthesia Balloons, because a lot of people on oh. Facebook, um, there, there's about 5,000 followers on the, the Facebook site, and most of them, of course, are not anesthesia providers, so they don't really know what <laughs> Pedia means. So Mean. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, so I'm going to try to play the video, hopefully, let me see. So I had to move into my living room because my uh, Wi-Fi, okay, I think this is a good, going to be a good answer. All right, can y'all see that? Oh, no, I hope you can see it. There we go. When little ones need surgery, they also need anesthesia. Lighting. Usually, they go to sleep by breathing anesthesia through a mask. But the mask smells yeah, bad, it's worse. and there it's really scary. So scary, they often fight to get away. Can you blame them? An upsetting mask delivery system is hard on everyone. That's why we're introducing a revolutionary way for kids to go to sleep before surgery. It's called the Pedia, the pediatric device for induction of anesthesia. Pedia inductions are a simple yet effective choice for today's patient-centered care. With Pedia, kids just think they're playing with a balloon. Balloons are fun, not scary. That makes kids happy, which makes everyone relieved and totally satisfied. So if you're interested in having your child or patient become a Pedia P, go to www.pediallc.com for more information on this exciting state-of-the-art system. All right. Well, that's actually on my website, pediallc.com, but I can show you right here. So here's the uh, circuit, right? Mm -hmm. And you just take the mask off. The Pedia has a uh, universal connector. So, and then you kind of... Um, Bring it, bring it up here. a little. There yeah. we go. Okay. Yeah. You put your finger here, and you it'll fill up, fill up with uh, gases. You you hand it to the kid. I can only blow out because I can't blow in, or I'm going to suck out my lungs. Don't so <laughs> you know, the the kid blows in and out, and it makes a cool. The the balloon goes in and out as they breathe, and uh, the whistle, uh, the siren whistle blows. So it sounds like this. <laughs> so as they you know, inhale and exhale, the balloon goes in and out and the, the, and the whistle goes, woo, woo, you know, this, ah, this, this like is actually one of my old models. So the, the whistle's not really as great as the newer ones, but um, yeah, so that's like how it works. Kazoo, like a kazoo yeah. when you blow it. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's so awesome. it's, it's uh, visual. And I'm hoping to get it in all colors. That patient Z, the one that I uh, invented it for, her only complaint at this point is, I want a pink one. Why can't I have a pink one? 
And I'm like, I'm working on it. <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. But the FDA is crazy about colors. They only let me pick one. Um, um, yeah, oh. They're nuts about all kinds of things. So, but, but for really, for good reason. So, um, so I'm happy to, ha I'm, I'm hoping to have all colors. So it's visual and the kid gets to use it themselves and the balloon goes in and out and the whistle blows. So it's tactile and visual and auditory. And yeah, so it kind of helps them on all levels. And it looks like a balloon when it's filled up. It just right. doesn't look like one sitting right there. So does it smell like anything fruity or anything or no? Uh, you can, you know, I don't put this in the instructions, but uh, some of the anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists that I used to work with who used it, they used to drop some of the, um, you know, the flavoring inside the balloon. Um, mm -hmm. So you can do that or, or nothing at all, you know, because, because it's not a mask that, it, that right. goes over their, their nose, um, they don't really smell the gases the way that uh, they do with, with the mask. So, um, mm. so that's not really, you know, a problem. And because it's something that's fun for them, uh, I, I still like to start with, you know, a little bit of uh, nitrous and oxygen and then turn on the SIBO. And usually mm -hmm. I'll let them take one or two breaths of um, the uh, oxygen, nitrous oxide, and then, and then I'll just uh, turn on the SIBO full, full blast um, after that. And within two or three more breaths, they're usually too sleepy to continue. And at that point, you can kind of do whatever you want. If they're deep enough to, um, if they're deep enough to put an LMA in, you can do that. If mm -hmm. you need to put an IV in, then you just pop that off, put the mask back on. But by then, they're not fighting anymore because right. they're, they're pretty sleepy. And then you just put the IV in, and you just kind of go on your way. And so um, after my little patient, Z, had uh, used it just one time in the OR, she was really funny. Um, the first time I brought her back, like I said, she almost kicked my teeth out. The second time, I used my prototype on her. And she was fighting and screaming, snots coming out of her nose. She was so upset. And so I filled up my, my, my then balloon, walked over to her and said, hey, Z, you want to play with my balloon? And she's fighting, punching people. She grabs my balloon, sticks it in her mouth. I didn't even have to tell her what to do with it. And she just starts, <gasps> and she went to sleep. <laughs> and then the next time I saw her, this screaming child who just was inconsolable, saw me and starts jumping up and down saying, we're going to go back. Let's go play with the balloon. And we get into the back and I, you know, went to hand her the balloon. She snatched it out of my hand, pushed me away, looked me straight in the eye like a, like only a four-year-old could do. And she says, I can do it myself. There you go. I'm like, you go girl, go ahead. And she did. That little girl put herself to sleep. And that's when I went home and told my husband, every kid needs to go uh, to sleep this way. In fact, that's my motto. That's the, uh, that's our little saying, um, every child, every time, because I think every child needs to go to sleep in a fun, non-traumatic way. So, awesome. um, yeah, oh my gosh, maybe I'll do peds once, once it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it'll convince you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mama's well, pretty happy too. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Now, how has family life been? Because you're working, then you're working on this. And you, I mean, how, how has that been? It was pretty rough for a while there. But um, yeah. as I, you know, my children are now a little older, so they're not, you know, clinging to me anymore. And mm -hmm. uh, kind of off doing their own thing now. And um, so... Life's pretty good because I've gotten over a lot of the big hurdles. Uh, it was pretty, um, it was, pre <laughs> it was pretty rough for a while there, and that's mm -hmm. why a couple of years ago my husband finally said, "Diane, you either have to choose. You have to choose. You either mm -hmm. have to um, choose pedia and back off, you know, everyday full-time patient care, or you just have to hang this up because it's just too much." Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so I had to make a choice, and so I, you know, I went per diem, uh, 
for a little while and then have just backed off a little bit more um, this past since January because there were a lot of big things happening that I, it's, it's, a, it's a little hard to, you know, have conference calls uh, in, in between patient cases. You can't right. be, you, you can't get a call from your engineer or from your, you know, chemist and, and, um, or your lawyer and say, oh, I got to call you back. I'm waking up the patient, you know? Yeah. Because these people, they work between nine and five. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. When I, back, when I listened to um, how I built this, a lot of the people are, say, similar. Like one of us had to stop working, you know, right. and take care of the business side of it while the other one, you know, kept right. the lights on while we were. Right. Um, right. Working on this. So, I yeah. mean, it's, it's the real deal. It's the real deal. Once you, once you get to a certain point and you have enough skin in it, you really have to make a decision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, this, this is awesome. You've inspired me so much. Oh my goodness. I have so many ideas, but I'm like, I don't even know where to start. So CRNA, I and I, CRNA and Interest and Innovators. Yeah. Yes, and then yes. just join and you can PM me. I help all kinds of uh, CRNAs who have questions. Uh, oh, they just PM me and I try to walk them through at least the first few steps. Mm -hmm. you know? So, How well received has this been within the anesthesia community, like with um, anesthesiologists and other CRNAs? Has it been well received? It's, or It's been pretty yeah. well received. Yeah, I, you know, there are um, some anesthesiologists um, physician anesthesiologists who have reached out to me from all over the country and all over the world, um, and as well as um, CR, uh, nurse anesthesiologists, um, nurse anesthetists who have also reached out to me. Mm -hmm. I still will get, you know, people who will say, well, my kids never have any anxiety, you know, and if that's their perception, then that's their perception, you know. Um, but there are a couple of uh, anesthesiologists who run major companies or major departments in um, big hospitals who want to do uh, clinical trials. So I would say that it's, it's, it's becoming very well known. So in fact, I just gave a lecture at the AANA um, Congress uh, in Chicago mm -hmm. and it was just the you know I'm not like this I'm I don't really like to be in the spotlight you know I'd rather just kind of you know melt into the background and all these people were coming up to me say Diane and I was like do I know you and they're like no Pedia and I'm like oh okay <laughs> I was like okay like they actually know my face which kind of mm -hmm. made me nervous but that's okay <laughs> you know that's okay I know you know. I'm the same way. I actually only started doing this to get over my shyness. Nobody believes me when I tell them this, but it's true. <laughs> You've done a good job. <laughs> well, I did not know it was going to turn into this. So now all of a sudden I'm doing lives and I'm on here and I'm like, I this none of this was planned. So I understand what you're saying completely. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, so before we go, we have about 10 minutes left. Does anyone okay. have additional questions? Um, I'm not sure if you can see down in the comment box, but there is um, comments that people can write in. So we'll see if anyone has any additional questions. Um, I want to thank you ahead of time for doing this with me. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how this uh, turns out, you know, in the near future. And uh I'm just super proud of you. This is awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that means a lot to me. <laughs> it really does. It's awesome. And you are living proof that, you know, hard work. Uh, I'm always talking about hard work as far as getting into CRNA school and then oh, yes. doing CRNA school. And you are, you know, this is something out on top of CRNA school, but it's the same. It's the same as when you get the rejection letters from a school saying you haven't been accepted. Yeah. It's the same feeling, I'm sure, when you get a rejection letter from, you know, a, a company or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. but you keep going, you're persevering. So mm -hmm. that in and of itself is admirable. So thank you, thank you. You're welcome.
You are very welcome. Um, so guys, if you have any additional questions for Diane, now's the time. We'll take like a, a couple minutes to answer them if so. If not, make sure you are following her on Instagram. Uh, Pedia, P-E-D-I-A, L-L-C. I'm actually going to type it down here in the comments. Mm -hmm. And make sure you look out for her Pedia balloon that is patented. Pa I, I should just stop trying to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's legal. It's legal. It, it's legal. Totally legal. It's FDA approved, yes. almost, right? Or it is. No, right? it's it's already FDA cleared. Okay, so it's mm -hmm. FDA cleared. Hopefully, we will be seeing it in um, all the facilities. Hopefully, she gets a big fat check. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see for for all of her hard work and her brain power and just her amazing girl power. She is uh, the definition of a woman who rocks. So. Make sure you're following her. So are you, her. Crystal? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. All right. So I guess there's no additional questions. Um, but thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I learned so much. I really did. I'm not just saying that. I learned. Good. You know, just, um, I know what I did want to ask you. So did you form your LLC before you went to the USPTO? Or was that kind of during the same time period? This, it was concurrent at the same time okay. because the USPTO will, um, will want you to use your company's name as mm -hmm. well as the FDA, as well as the FDA. You have to okay. form some kind of company, whether it's an S Corp or a LLC or whatever. You, you can't not have one because everyone is going to ask you your company name, your EIN, all of that. So, um, Mm -hmm. That's yeah. good to know. Good to know. Yeah. One thing I did want to mention before we uh, sign off here mm -hmm. is if you are interested in invention and innovation, my only caution is this. Don't do it for the money. Mm -hmm. Because the promise of money, which may or may not materialize, will not get you through the dark night of your soul mm. because you will have those you will have plenty of nights where you're up and you can't sleep and you're thinking what am i doing you know right. um and you could everything could be going great and it could still fall flat so you have to do this because it's something you really believe in you really have to believe in this and you have to have a little bit of inventor's blood and a little entrepreneurial blood in your mm -hmm. system um, and reach out to uh, your, your other uh, CRNAs who have already gone down this path. I, I don't think I could have done it without a, a few major people like Jay Tadlaska and Amy Shepard of Copilot, David, David Gomez of Infinitus uh, Medical Technologies, um, Louis Stanfield. There's like so, there's, there's a, a handful of them who helped me through those times when, or walked me back from the, the ledge when yeah. I was about to yeah. jump off. So yeah. um, don't do it for the money. Do it yeah. for, do it for the right reasons. And that goes with anything, like anything you do. A lot of the um, YouTubers that I listen to and things like that, they all say the same thing. Um, yeah. You know, especially when you're on a spiritual journey, you have to do yes. it to help others. Um, right. And, and the abundance comes later in different yes. forms, whether it's monetary or love or other ways, but your main goal has to do it to bring substance and something better for others, for other yes. mankind. So, Absolutely. yeah. Well, awesome. So nice talking to you. I, I'm glad you were able to do it. It wasn't too hard, right? To no, it wasn't. This is my first live. So thank you for making it easy. <laughs> Yay! I'm so happy. And I hope I get to meet you in the future at one of the meetings. I, I will look for you. Yes. I'll, I'll send you a little PM every time I'm going to be at one. Okay. Yes. Yes. In I, fact, I, I'm going to be at the leadership conference. Um, in November, they have something called the Sharps Tank. Not the Shark oh. Tank, the Sharps Tank. 
Oh. So I wanted to to do it just so that I could report back to the um, to the CRNA I and I and let them know what that was all about and what my experience oh, yeah. was. About. Yeah. So it should be fun. That sounds that sounds fun. Yeah, I'm definitely going to also send you a request on the um, the CRNA Innovators uh, site. So excellent. So I will do that for sure. Oh, I'm excited. Okay. I'm so excited. All right. All right, Diane, well, have a good night, and thank you again. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right, bye.